Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Progenesis Academy webinar series. My name is Rajni Kajuria. I'm director, uh, I'm director of clinical genomics and scientific affairs here at Progenesis India. I'm looking after uh, clinical operation of Progenesis India. Uh, I'm very proud to say that our company is a leading provider in pre-implantation genetic testing. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, my co-moderator, Dr. Sheila Ali. Dr. Sheila Ali will be co-moderating with me. She is the Vice President of Science and Innovation in Progenesis Incorporation. Thank you, Sheila, for joining us and helping me co-moderate this session. And thank you, everyone, for finding time and joining us today uh, for today's webinar. For those who are not familiar with our uh, Progenesis Academy program, uh, I want to let you know that we are a nonprofit program dedicated towards uh, embryology, embryology education, and reproductive medicine. Before we get started, we have few uh, announcements to make. Let me share my slide first. Sheila, let me know once you see the slide. Yes, we're able to see your slide. If you'll go into slide uh, presentation mode, please. Yes. Yeah. So before we get started, uh, we have a few announcements to make. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to announce that we are organizing our first annual symposium, uh, Genes, which is Genetic Embryology and Endocrinology Symposium, which will held between June 1 to 3, 2023 at Omni San Diego Hotel, California, USA. Registration of symposium is live and early bird pricing will end in May. So go and visit our website and register for the same. And you can contact us through email for getting more information. And there is another important announcement that we will be announcing name of two lucky winners, which we will select randomly from the attendees for, and the prize will be a complimentary registration for our annual symposium. And uh, so stay tuned to see who is the lucky ones. Now coming back to the webinar schedule, please note that uh, we have, you will have the opportunity to submit your question by typing in the QA pane of the control panel. You may also send your question at the time during the presentation. We will address them during the QA session at the end of presentation. Today we are having a presentation on a very important topic, fertility preservation in young women with breast cancer. I would now like to introduce our eminent speaker of today's webinar. It's my privilege to welcome and introduce Dr. Nalini Kaul Mahajan. Dr. Nalini uh, carries, Dr. Nalini doesn't need any introduction actually. She's a senior consultant uh, of reproductive medicine. She's director of Mother and Child Hospital Delhi. She is president of Asian Society of Fertility Preservation and she's a founder president of Fertility Pre Preservation Society of India. She's also a board member of International Society of Fertility Preservation. She was holding a uh, post of president uh, in previous year for Indian Fertility Society. Dr. Nalini is also a chief editor of the Onco Fertility Journal. And she has been a recipient of gold medal prize, uh, president's gold medal prize and many other gold medals in her name. Dr. Nalini was conferred with Lifetime Achievement Award uh, by Indian Fertility Society in year 2021. Dr. Nalini's research interests are endometrial receptivity, fertility preservation, regenerative medicine, and Dr. Nalini has multiple publications in national and international peer-reviewed journal, and she has many book chapters in different books of reproductive medicines. So, uh, Dr. Nalini, now I hand over it to you. And you can share your presentation and start the presentation. Thank you very much, Rajni, for this long introduction and very kind introduction. And thank you, Progenesis, for inviting me to uh, give this lecture on or talk to you about really um, fertility preservation in breast cancer patients. <clears throat> can you uh, look? Can you see my screen? Is it visible? Yes, we can see your screen. You can see the screen. Okay. So this is, a, you know, become an increasingly important uh, topic now. And, uh, you know, th through the uh, lecture, I will look at various aspects of what are the risks uh, in to fertility in breast cancer? Is there a special need for BRCA mutation patients? What are the options we have? You know, what is the safety aspect? So 
you know, one by one, I'll look into it and briefly give you an overview of, uh, you know, the importance and the possibilities of fertility preservation in breast cancer patients. As you can see, breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed can female cancer across the globe. In India, what we find is that the younger women, women under 35, the incidence of breast cancer is more than in the West and more of triple receptor negative cancers, which are more aggressive and really require very heavy uh, chemotherapy. So, uh, you know, a lot of uh, Patients also in the developing countries are detected much later, and therefore the survivorship in the developing world is a little lower than survivorship in the developed countries, where it is almost 90% uh, in the US and Australia. So definitely these women who survive breast cancer, who have not yet completed their family, need uh, you know, something to... Uh, help them on, help them to achieve their family after their breast cancer treatment is over. The first question that we really need to ask is, does breast cancer pose a risk to fertility at all? And well, you can see that breast cancer treatment, uh, you know, it involves surgery, it involves chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Chemotherapy can be both adjuvant and neoadjuvant. And a majority of these people will face fertility issues after chemotherapy. Now, what happens with chemotherapy is that we, you know, chemotherapy attra uh, attacks the ovary in both uh, directly and indirectly. There is apoptosis of the fo growing follicles. Now, not only are the growing follicles attacked, but when the growing follicles die, the ovary throws out more primordial follicles into circulation because it senses that there is nothing growing and it needs to do that. And because of that, more and more primordial follicles which come into the growing pool get attacked and die. And therefore you have a huge reduction in oocyte quantity. Apart from that, there is DNA disintegration within the oocytes and this leads to a reduced quality. Vascular injury and cortical fibrosis, which uh, is induced by the chemotherapeutic agents, all adds to this insult. Now, the degree of, uh, you know, the damage depends on the type of the drug we use, the dose we give, and the age of the patient. Not all chemotherapeutic agents have the same level of gonadotoxicity, and you can see here the different groups uh, leading to, uh, you know, poor uh, fertility prognosis, moderate and good fertility prognosis. And amongst them, the alkylating agents, which are not cell cycle specific, create the maximum da damage. And if you look at these common regimes that are chemotherapy regimes that are used in breast cancer, all of them include uh, cyclophosphamide. So therefore, the chances of amenorrhea and infertility are high, and they are higher after the age if the woman is older than 35. And the reason for this, we all know, is that women have a finite number of eggs and the ovarian reserve decreases with age. So she has less in her bank. And when the chemotherapeutic agents attack the ovary, the bank, uh, the reserve gets diminished greatly. Now, the breast cancer, we deal with two very special groups. One are those with who are BRCA mutation carriers. Now, BRCA1 is uh, re required or is involved in double strand DNA break repair. And if there is an impaired or a mutated gene, it impairs that ability to repair the double strand breaks in DNA and therefore increases the risk of oocyte aging, apoptosis, and meiotic errors. And it has been seen that patients who are BRCA mutation 1 carriers, they have a lower ovarian reserve and an earlier menopause. And when they are undergoing IVF stimulation, they need a far greater amount of gonadotrophins for stimulation. The other special group is hormone receptor positive breast cancers. Now, these women generally are given tamoxifen, which is a uh, serum, and uh, it protects the breast. And unfortunately, though it does not affect the ovarian reserve, but it has to be given for five to 10 years. So if a woman starts her uh, tamoxifen at the age of 30, 
she's going to end it at 40. And by that time, of course, the ovarian reserve because of the natural aging process has gone away and therefore there is a huge impact on fertility. So when assessing the gonadotoxic risk, we look at two factors, the patient-related factors, which are age, her pretreatment reserve, her BRCA mutation, history of smoking, age at menarche, BMI and other genetic variants, and treatment-related factors as to what regime she's on and what is the dose and the duration of regime, and if she has received any additional therapy. All in all, we have to remember that these women have a reduced reproductive lifespan and they have a 70% lower chance of pregnancy, spontaneous pregnancy after breast cancer treatment. So therefore, fertility preservation becomes almost mandatory in this group of cancers. So we have two groups that we need to address. The first are patients with a recent diagnosis who are going to go in for treatment. And then of course, are patients who've already had their treatment, but are looking to still you know, complete their reproductive needs. So these are two patients that we need, groups of patients that we need to assess. And what do we assess in them? The most important thing is ovarian reserve before they go in for treatment. And once treatment is over, we also need to evaluate the other infertility parameters like the male factor, tubes, uterus, et cetera. The ovarian reserve, these days, the gold standard for assessing it is the AMH or the anti-mullerian hormone produced by early follicles. And the other important parameter is the antral follicle count, which is you know, an ultrasound-based uh, test that we do. We count the number of antral follicles in the early follicular phase. That is the best time to do it, though we can roughly estimate at any time of the cycle. The normal ovarian reserve is supposed to be more than two nanograms per mil. When chemotherapy is given, if you look at the AMH, it just immediately crashes after AMH, uh, after chemotherapy is given, showing that you know, the follicles have undergone apoptosis. However, there is a recovery over a period of almost 12 months or sometimes even longer than that. But it depends, the recovery really depends on what the AMH has been before. If they've had a good ovarian reserve or an AMH over two nanograms, the recovery will be better. But if the AMH has been lower to start with, then the recovery rate is very low at about 2.6% per month. So having looked at these basic assessments, let's see what are the strategies for fertility preservation and protection. Now, the protective, on the protective aspect, we have GNRH analog, and we're going to talk about it. It's a very important aspect of uh, fertility protection in breast cancer patients. And on the definitive front, we have preservation of gametes and ovarian tissue. So you can preserve oocytes, you can preserve embryos, you can preserve ovarian tissue, and you can also preserve immature uh, oocytes. So how do GnRH analogs work? How do they protect the ovary? They actually mimic the prepubertal status by depressing the FSH and LH. That means there will be no growing follicles in the ovary and the chemotherapeutic agents will not be able to attack as much because they attack the growing follicles more than they attack the primordial follicles. So that is the main mechanism by which they work. It is believed that they also work directly on the ovary by you know, reducing the or initiating the anti-apoptotic ovarian molecules and also reduce the uterine ovarian perfusion. If there is low perfusion, the exposure to chemotherapy becomes reduced and therefore less chances of action on the ovary. So these are the proposed mechanisms of action. And what has been seen and in the, presented in this uh, meta-analysis by Lambertini in 2018, when, in which he took a whole number of trials and uh, uh, you know, systemic reviews, and it was seen that there is evidence for efficacy and safety of temporary ovarian suppression. It reduces the likelihood of chemotherapy-induced premature ovarian insufficiency and also may potentially improve future fertility in premenopausal patients with early breast cancer. And this is across the board, both for hormone receptive positive and hormone receptive negative cancers. So today, the guidelines say that we must give uh, GnRH agonist in all premenopausal breast cancer patients who are going to receive chemotherapy. However, it is just protection 
and not preservation. We cannot tell them that, okay, you need not preserve your uh, gametes. Uh, this is good enough. It isn't good enough. It may delay menopause. It may give them some amount of protection, but it cannot really offer great chances of pregnancy later. We start the GnRH agonist a week before chemotherapy to avoid the flare effect of the agonist and continue it until two weeks after completion of chemotherapy. And of course, the risk of such a prolonged GnRH agonist administration is a decrease in bone density. So having done that, if you are offering fertility preservation to the patients, we have to evaluate them prior to doing that. And for that, the first and most important thing is to evaluate the oncological status. We must know the diagnosis, the staging. Most importantly, what is the survival rate for that patient and recurrence rate? No point in offering fertility preservation to a patient where the survival rate is not going to be good. The next important step is fertility risk assessment, which again, you look at the disease treatment protocol, the age, the ovarian reserve, because the success of procedures depends on the reserve, whether they are estrogen sensitive tumors, because your drugs are going to be tailored to that. What is the time available? Because procedure will be tailored to that. The pubertal status, previous exposure to chemotherapy, and of course, all other social and religious constraints that you may be. Uh, faced with, but most importantly, does the patient even desire fertility preservation? Now, of all the uh, you know pre-procedure workups that are going to be done, we all know that on the medical front, what is going to be done, but the most important in these patients is counseling. They must have genetic counseling in the case of uh, where BRCA mutations are present, but definitely social counseling is extremely important because the patient must know what is the risk of the procedure, what is the reproductive outcome of the procedure, and the procedure has to be explained in detail. Age-specific counseling is extremely important, and this helps the patient without the bias of the doctor, attending doctor to be able to make, make an informed decision. So the strategies, definitive strategies that we have are oocyte vitrification and embryo freezing. Now, both that means both oocytes or eggs and embryos can be frozen. Of course, for embryo freezing, we need a husband or a partner to provide the semen, and ovarian stimulation is required in both the cases. Oocyte vitrification is you know, becoming more popular because it provides reproductive autonomy to the women. We know that after a you know, disease like cancer, which is a chronic and a prolonged treatment disease, very uh, physically, mentally, and emotionally, uh, uh, you know, burdening the patient and the family, many relationships break down. So the woman must have control over her reproductive material. Problem with oocyte vitrification is that you need a large number of oocytes, 12 to 15 or even more if the woman is older, because there will be a loss in thawing, there will be a loss in fertilization and further embryo cleavage. The implantation potential is supposed to be about 6% per survived oocyte. So what are the stimulations then that we do in breast cancer patients? So apart from the conventional start protocols, there are certain protocols which, you know, help allow us to start the stimulation as soon as we see the patient and their random start protocol and a luteal start protocol. But most importantly, for HR positive breast cancers, we have protocols in which we, you know, protect the patient by giving letrozole or tamoxifen so that their recurrence rate becomes much lower or they are protected against the recurrence of cancer. So in the conventional START protocols, we know that ovarian stimulation starts from day two of the menstrual cycle and the GnRH analog is added before or after stimulation to prevent the premature surge and I'll not really go into details of that. The random start protocol is based on the finding that, you know, there are multiple waves of follicles which develop uh, are there in a menstrual cycle. So, uh, you know, there'll be one uh, wave of follicles and then another wave starts growing. So, 
This targets the second wave of the follicles. And this you can see on ultrasound when you will see, you know, a small, you'll have a dominant follicle growing up to 12 or 13. And behind that, you'll see follicles of six to seven millimeters in the ovary, which shows you that there, are, there is a second wave which is growing. And that is the wave which is targeted. So what is done is that ovarian stimulation is started for these follicles and you discount the lead follicle altogether. And you give, you start your GnRH antagonist when this, the second wave of follicle reaches 12 millimeters. And you really completely discount this follicle. This may ovulate or not ovulate. You don't worry about that. And this trigger is given, of course, at the same time when the follicle size is about 18 or 19. And the pickup would be done 36 hours after that. Now, in a luteal start, there can be two scenarios. You may have a follicle which has reached 18 millimeters already, in which case you give an agonist trigger, allow ovulation to happen, and then start stimulation. Or the patient has already come to you post-ovulation, then you straight away start a stimulation and add your GnRH antagonist to prevent a premature surge when the follicle size reaches about 12 millimeters. Now, it has been seen that the you know, oocytes recovered and the M2s are similar with both the luteal st start random protocol or as they're as good as the conventional protocols in terms of the number of eggs that you re recover. However, they are much longer. The stimulation required is two days longer and the total amount of gonadotrophins required are also higher. Now, going to the HR positive breast cancer groups, letrozole is added to the stimulation protocol right from the time you start gonadotrophins on day two or three. And what this does is it crashes the estradiol levels, keeping them very low throughout the stimulation. And you continue the letrozole even after the eggs have been retrieved so that the levels remain under 50 picograms. And after that, you can discontinue and patient can go on with the gonadotropin uh, with her uh, chemotherapeutic regime. So this increases the safety profile uh, tremendously for these women who would who are HR positive and estrogen, high estrogen levels are going to be detrimental to their breast cancer and also allows you to recover a good number of oocytes. Now, initially, many uh, studies showed that the number of eggs retrieved are the same, but over time, there has been a concern that the number of mature eggs that you retrieve when you add letrozole to the stimulation protocol are lower. Now, the reason is a little unclear, but it is believed that when you give letrozole, the antral space is formed earlier. So perhaps we are taking out the eggs much before their cytoplasmic nuclear maturity has been achieved. And therefore, the uh, you know suggestion that you should take uh, give the trigger only when the follicle size is 20 millimeters rather than just 17 or 18. Another issue with giving letrozole is a concern rather is is there a change in the follicular microenvironment because we know that uh, you know the androgen to estrogen ratio does get altered when you give letrozole so this particular study looked at the follicular fluid levels of the hormones as well as the cumulus cell gene expression related to oocyte quality and what they found was that the Estrogen, estradiol levels are significantly lower in the follicular fluid and the testosterone levels are significantly higher. Between the two types of triggers, that means the GnRH agonist and the HCG, when GnRH agonist trigger was given, the estradiol levels were slightly better. Looking at the cumulus gene expression, it was seen that within HCG trigger, uh, you know, it, the expression was poorer, it was lower, whereas with the GnRH A trigger, the gene expression was significantly better in the study group as compared to, to the control group. So the bottom line is that when you are stimulating the patients, it is better, you have to add letrozole for safety sake, but maybe it is better that you wait till the follicle sizes are 20 before you give the final trigger for maturation, and that trigger should be with, given with GnRH um, agonist rather than with HCG. Now, tamoxifen is another, is a serm. It is also used as, been used in breast uh, cancers for very long. 
Tamoxifen can also be added to the stimulation regimes. Again, it is added as you start with the stimulation and it protects uh, the breast tissue because uh, you know it occupies the receptors. Now, very uh, somehow this has not become as popular as letrozole, but one of the earliest studies with it, uh, which was done by Professor Maro, showed that giving tamoxifen was, you know, improved the safety profile. It was, they did a three to 10 year follow-up and these patients did not show any increased risk of recurrence or a late mortality. So it's a good drug to give because you can then carry it on in the HR positive patients because they would probably be on tamoxifen even after, uh, after your, uh, you know, fertility preservation has been done. So far as the ag trigger is concerned, the choice remains GnRH agonist, one, because of the safety profile, two, as I just said, that the follicular fluid uh, micro, uh, the parameters are much better, and uh, the number of M2s, some people say, are also, or the mature oocytes are also uh, better with giving a GnRH agonist trigger. Now, when we talk about fertility preservation, we are always wanting to maximize the yield. And uh, so people think of doing two uh, stimulations. And now uh, one of the stimulation protocols that is being done is called the dual stim protocol. That means you retrieve, you stimulate the ovary, retrieve the eggs, wait for 48 hours or 72 hours, and then stimulate again in the luteal phase and collect or increase the number of oocytes that you can collect for fertility preservation. It is uh, physically a cumbersome protocol, but uh, well, it can be done. And uh, where you have your, you know, you want to maximize your numbers, uh, it can definitely be done without increasing any uh, risk to the patient. Now, as I said, the probability of achieving pregnancy in IVF is related to oocyte numbers. So one of the concerns has been does cancer per se affect uh, the oocyte numbers? Well, according to this uh, you know, study by Turan et al. in 2018, which looked at you know, oocyte numbers in the different patients with different cancer diagnosis. And what they found was that in breast cancer patients, uh, you know, the cancer diagnosis per se does not change the number of mature oocytes or the total oocytes that would be recovered as compared to the non-cancer group. But definitely patients with BRCA mutation, BRCA1 mutation, would be those where we might expect a lower number of oocytes. So looking specifically at the BRCA mutations, a comparison of BRCA1, BRCA2, and a control group, it was seen that the BRCA1 patients showed lower AMH values, that means a lower reserve. So you got lower number of mature oocytes from them and they needed higher doses of gonadotrophin. So definitely amongst the BRCA mutation group, the BRCA1, uh, mut those carrying BRCA1 mutation are the ones we need to look out for because their ovarian reserve is much lower and therefore they are not going to do as well in fertility preservation. The safety profile has been looked at very extensively, and this Swedish-based uh, register-based cohort study showed that the relapse rate is in these patients who have gone undergone fertility preservation was the same as the unexposed controls. That means those breast cancer patients who had not undergone ovarian stimulation for fertility preservation. And this re these results remain unchanged after adjustment for tumor size, ER status, lymph nodes, et cetera. So it's very reassuring to know that yes, you can offer fertility preservation very safely to these young women who have uh, unfortunately got breast cancer. Going on to the newer strategies, we have ovarian tissue cryopreservation. And this is, you know, you can, the only thing that you can offer to prepubertal girls. And it is also, uh, offered where new adjuvant therapies are being given because there, you know, they are not going to wait to give the chemotherapy because of the increased risk of uh, increased staging of the cancer. So chemotherapy has to be given so you can, you know, preserve ovarian tissue and then get on with your chemotherapy. Doesn't require 12 to 14 days as we do for ovarian stimulation. And it can also be done after one dose of chemotherapy has been given, which you definitely cannot do when with oocyte or embryo freezing. You can combine it with the surgery that the patient is already undergoing for breast. 
However, it is not advised for women with a low ovarian reserve or for older women where the basic, you know, number of uh, follicles, primordial follicles in the ovary are going to be lower. In vitro maturation is an innovative therapy. Unfortunately, it requires very highly skilled embryologists because once you retrieve the immature oocytes, the maturation rate is 50% in the best of hands. So at the moment, there is still a long way to go over there. And uh, just a word about ovarian tissue cryopreservation. What we do is the cortex is, uh, you know, taken. The medulla is separated. So thin strips of the ovarian tissue are either, uh, you know, cryopreserved through slow freezing or vitrification. And the advantage is that when you transplant them, you can transplant, you know, two or three strips at a time or five strips at a time and you have a whole lot of strips so the reproductive window is greatly increased and uh, you know it has been shown to be very successful the pregnancy rates are almost up to 35 percent with ovarian tissue transplantation as more and more uh, you know you gain experience with the procedure it has seemed to be very very fruitful because not only does it uh, you know, allow reproductive window to increase, but it also alleviates menopausal symptoms. So uh, this is something that is coming up in a very big way now. The longevity of the graft is about seven to 10 years. And as I said before, it cannot be offered when the AMH is low, like below 0.5 nanograms, or the age is over 36. It is not really advocated. The problem with... Uh, is of transplantation because we have to worry when we are transplanting this ovarian tissue of reimplanting cancer cells. So we have to look at the cancers where there is high risk of uh, ovarian metastasis. And you can see these are leukemias and neuroblastomas are very high risk group and ovarian tissue freezing and transplantation is not at all advocated there. But breast cancer is a low risk area and you can do this. Now in patients with BRCA mutation and hormone receptive positive patients, ovarian tissue transplantation is done heterotrophic. That means it can be done under the skin of the arm or at a heterotrophic site where after, you know, a pregnancy is achieved, the tissue can be removed and, uh, you know, does not pose a risk for the patient. Again, the first and important thing that we all have to understand that pregnancy per se does not increase the risk of cancer rec recurrence or affect the disease-free survival or the overall survival for breast cancer patients. And therefore, uh, you know, it we can very, very safely tell them that they can preserve their uh, oocytes or embryos and then go on to having a baby without worrying about the risk of recurrence. So women who do preserve their oocytes or tissue, they have a 2.3 times higher chance of giving birth than those who do not. And, uh, you know, as I said, the live birth rates are about 22 to 45% with these frozen cryopreserved oocytes and embryos. Unfortunately, the utilization rate is rather low. It's about 7 to 10%, though more and more women are now coming back to get their embryos and oocytes, uh, you know, used. The problem is, and as we talked before about does cancer per se affect fertility? Now, we can see this when a comparison was made between elect those who had frozen their oocytes electively vis-a-vis -vis women who had done it for oncofertility, the oocyte survival post thaw was lower in the cancer patient, which means definitely the ovarian function, maybe the cytokines, the debility, all these effect do affect the oocyte to some extent. And that is why the clinical pregnancy rate and the live birth rates are significantly lower than women who don't have cancer. Women with BRCA mutation, again, a special group, PGT should be offered to these uh, patients. The embryo can be checked for BRCA mutation before transplanting. Risk to offspring is another very common question that you're asked. Will my child carry the same risk of cancer? Well, one, that it does not carry the risk of congenital anomalies higher than that of the general population. We don't know as yet, uh, you know, the long-term effects of freezing for a very long time, but so far, uh, you know, we have not seen an increased aneuploidy rate. Children per se conceived through ART do have a higher risk of adverse birth outcomes, as we know, PIH, placenta, previa, and, uh, you know, 
new, uh, small small for day babies, uh, preterm babies. So those risks are definitely higher per se with IVF and maybe also related to the infertility. And many of these breast cancer patients actually get diagnosed while they are getting screened for uh, fertility. They are looking for fertility and you know this is discovered. So perhaps that is a could be an additional factor for adverse outcomes per, per se. The use of cryopreserved oocytes do, does not uh, you know, increase the risk. So uh, to summarize, you have a newly diagnosed woman with early breast cancer. You counsel if she doesn't want to go for fertility preservation, let her be. If she does, if she's below 40, you know, you can, you have time available, you can do ovarian stimulation and oocyte cryopreservation. If she doesn't have time, you go for ovarian tissue cryopreservation. If she's 41 to 45 years, she wants to preserve ovarian function because fertility is difficult at this age. You can preserve, uh, you know, do temporary ovarian suppression with GnRH analog, or maybe even, you know, uh, look at ovarian tissue if you can put uh, cryopreserve and then put it back. So these are, uh, this is a rough outline. Of course, every patient presents differently and then has to be handled very differently. So to end, fertility preservation is extremely important for breast cancer patient. Giving GnRH analog for fertility protection in breast cancer patients has become the norm now. And uh, oocyte cryopreservation is the favored mortality BRCA1 mutations, be careful. They are going to have a poorer response and counsel them accordingly. Ovarian tissue crab preservation in India, we are just about getting there. We, we started a few years back, but really to, we have not gone into yet into transplants, but it's available and uh, available and easily done. It's not a problem. Safety of uh, fertility preservation procedures has been established and as counseling, one of the most important thing in this whole fertility preservation arena is counseling. Because, uh, you know, if the patient is not mentally prepared, then the outcome can be quite disastrous. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for a patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Nalini. That was such a wonderful presentation. You were very beautifully covered each and everything. And uh, every question I can see, even I had too many things in my mind going on, but I could see you explained everything in your presentation. Very beautiful. Congratulations for that. Thank, Thank you so you. much. You. Yeah, so now we will go ahead and take the questions. Uh, I think we have a question from our audience, from Trisha. So Trisha, Dr. Nalini, she's asking that, are these fertility strategies and options available only to breast cancer patients or also to people who are at risk of developing hereditary breast and ovarian cancer due to carrying a pathogenic gene variation? See, that is why where it comes to something which is hereditary, you have to do genetic counseling. It is available. Everything is available. But then you will go according to, uh, you know, the protocol of what, when you're putting it back, doing the procedure is no problem at all. But when you are replacing, whether it's an embryo, if you can genetically screen it before replacing it so that the patients don't, that their child doesn't have to go through the same kind of trauma as they did, definitely you can do it. For ovarian tissue crab preservation, again, you have to see where, ovarian risk of ovarian malignancy is high, their heterotrophic transplant can be done. You, you cannot put it back into the ovary because that would increase uh, risk very much for the patient. When you do heterotrophic transplant, basically IVF has to be done because when you're stimulating from here, to the <laughs> tube cannot pick up the uh, egg. So you have to do an IVF and you retrieve the eggs and you implant the embryo in the uterus and once you know that work is done then that tissue can be removed so the patient uh, is not at risk okay thank you thank you dr nalini for answering the question so next question is from my side uh, dr nalini which i wanted to ask you that as we can say that uh, you you said that uh, that in india we are just going over there so we, I think in Western uh, standards, things were going, uh, doing, they were doing it very, uh, at a, like before us. And how is the uptake, if you see as a clinician, that how much patients are aware about these things and they are coming up and uh, asking for these? 
means do you see a uh, uptake over the see, years actually that now the uh, fertility preservation awareness has increased i remember in 2000 and uh, you know 10 when i did the first fertility preservation conference and i had invited professor mero and all these people there was very little awareness and you know the oncologists were not really keen on even attending or listening or participating and I started the society and then we, you know we started disseminating information today I can say that there's a lot has been done but a lot lot more needs to be done because when the patient asks the doctor automatically you know is forced to offer it to them so the oncologists were the first barrier actually they are really changing the younger oncologists are now becoming uh, you know very proactive about fertility preservation and i think i receive a call practically every day from somebody or the other they are becoming proactive and taking to it but uh, in terms of uh, you know procedure and where the patients should have it done they have to be very careful because IVF can be offered by anybody but we have to remember that this is long-term cryopreservation so it should not be done in centers which don't have that facility or the stability to keep that tissue or the gametes for that long because if you don't preserve them then the patient for the patient that's all that she has so, you know, you have to choose well when you're, uh, you know, going for fertility preservation, especially in Onco. Okay, okay. So then, Dr. Nalini, as you said, that patient has to be aware of, they need to know some. So what do you recommend as a clinician to the patient that these are the parameters they should look forward for going to the fertility clinic? Because, you know, in they India, should, we see yeah, now, yeah, yeah, we, we have, have a, a huge number of clinics. And yeah, we you have a clinic at every now. corner, but they need to yes. look at something which has an established background. They need to know and understand that they ha there's a good embryology lab because that's where the preservation is going to happen. And if, you know, there is no stability over there, then there is danger of uh, patients losing their tissue or gametes. So that is something that they need to look at, that the embryology setup in an IVF center is good and the center is stable. You know, like so many centers yeah. are popping up now. So if, you know, they had their, uh, their preserved oocytes or what's happened to that, we don't know. Yeah. And the government will not allowing for shifting of embryos or oocytes or gametes, it's become a problem. Yeah, I agree. I agree, completely agree. And uh, then, Dr. Nalini, do we have uh, in Indian standards, like, do we have made a kind of a, a kind of a, uh, like, guideline for the patients? Yes, we have. We yes. have the Fertility Preservation Society of India has brought out a guideline, uh, but, you okay. know, which is specifically takes into account our situation. And we did this exercise yeah. with all the major uh, onco hospitals across India, Ames mm -hmm. and Tata and all this, we went and, you know, had uh, sessions with them, asked, made them answer questions. And then we sat and formulated the guidelines and they're out there. They've been published. That's, that's really great. I will get that from you and I will try to even uh, raise awareness from my side too. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. And the uh, next question I have is that, is it safe to perform a control ovarian stimulation for oocyte or embryo cryopreservation in patients who are candidate to neoadjuvant systematic therapy? See, the, and where you're giving neoadjuvant, that's where the ovarian tissue cryopreservation comes into play because you don't have that time. You need at a minimum of 12 days. And when we say 12, it actually sometimes extends to 14. Honestly speaking, because okay. patient doesn't come to you on the second day of the cycle, they will invariably come to you in the middle of a cycle. And if they are in the middle of the cycle, it takes that couple of days longer for the stimulation process to happen. And it's very rare that your oncologist will allow you those 14 days. They don't. So for them, the, you know, ovarian tissue cryopreservation is the answer because, or they can preserve the oocytes after they're through with therapy. But by, by that time, really very, the reserve is so low that you don't get much. I've done a, a couple, like, a few patients like that. The quality of the oocytes is very poor once they're through with their okay. chemotherapy and everything. So you okay. have to wait okay. six months after chemotherapy is over. So that the lot of growing follicles, which takes about six months, that goes off and a fresh lot, which has not been exposed to chemotherapy comes in and then you, can, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. Of those. Noted. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
And Dr. Nalli, if I ask you um, in a layman term, if you have to say that who are the best candidate for ovarian tissue preservation, which patients will be the best for best candidates? Who, who you will select? See, in breast cancer, actually, uh, ovarian tissue cryopreservation was not very popular, except the when new adjuvant therapy is, has to be given. Uh, but um, now, because ovarian tissue, you know, now so much time has elapsed since this pro procedure came in, it's no longer considered experimental. It's now come into the mainstream. The pregnancy rates are almost like 20, 32% with the tissue replaced tissue and it's a very prolonged reproductive window so maybe more you know the, the trend will be also to freeze for breast cancer but at the moment they go there is more of oocyte and embryo freezing for breast cancer patients rather than ovarian tissue so ovarian tissue is prepubertal girls new adjuvant chemotherapy and uh, you know in other situations where you may not be able to uh, you know stimulate the patient okay Okay, thank you, Dr. Nani. So, and my another question to you is when, like you have uh, recommended in your presentation that when uh, it's important that patients should go for PGTM for uh, before starting with this thing. So what is your uh, uh, like uh, experience that when you have these patients, do they agree to go for PGTM or not? Actually, I have not replaced an embryo for a BRCA uh, mutation carrier. In fact, the, you know, the stimulation was so poor, oocyte quality was so poor that, you know, we didn't even reach that stage. But uh, more and more patients are now ex accepting PGTM. In fact, they ask for it, you know, they Google all these things and they come and ask for it. And I'm not talking of onco patients, it's more the, the non-oncology patients. But once the information mm -hmm. is out there, people do start, uh, you know, asking. Okay, okay. And the next question comes from Sheila. Sheila want to ask that, what are the concerns of germline gamete exposure, exposure to chemotherapy? And what are the success rate of IVF treatment post chemotherapy in patients? Yeah, that, that's, that's a wonderful that, question. No, no. Uh, so, sorry, if I want to sort of clarify, you're saying uh, the success of, IVF in patients who have been treated and now are going with IVF with the current gametes, not with preserved gametes. That's correct. Because poorer. you had mentioned, yeah, yes. it is poorer. The pregnancy chances are poorer. They don't do as well because the gametes have been exposed. The oocytes have been exposed to chemotherapy and somehow the pregnancy rates are much lower. And in the same women, if donor gametes are used, the pregnancy rates are as good as you know, the non-onco, non-cancer patients, but uh, cancer per se, from that in itself, you can see that uh, you know there is an effect on the. Yes, absolutely, and that's true. I think um, germline effects are very important, and it's important to educate the patients as well as you know the the clinical teams of the effects of chemotherapy on germline cells. Because, yes, you know, of course, there is a chance to re-stimulate the patient post treatment, but um, you've hit the nail right on the head. I mean, there there are effects, and the education piece of it is very important. Thank you for confirming that. Yeah. And Dr. Nalini, my last question to you that, as you said, that uh, counseling, you have very rightly mentioned that counseling is very important. So do you recommend that uh, when we are talking about uh, fertility preservation, uh, having a multidisciplinary approach is very important where we should have uh, every specialist? What do you recommend that what, what team should be there? As Absolutely. In fact, uh, you know, the right members from in the that, beginning. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've been telling everybody in all the oncology centers that have one room for in let a fertility reproductive specialist come in and be in your OPD so that the patient doesn't have to go to different places and he gets the attention from all the units right there. Because the patient's already so troubled, you know, the cancer is the very word cancer, you know, strikes fear in your heart. And they're dealing with something which is a terminal, at the end of it, it is a terminal illness. And you don't know whether you're going to sail through it or you're not. And we're giving them hope that, okay, you can even have children. On one side, they're worried about, you know, their life. And on the other hand, we are offering uh, a hope of having a normal family so they need uh, that counseling and they don't need to go from one clinic to the other clinic to the third clinic to achieve this it should all be in one 
concentrated area where you know they can their uh, you know issues can be addressed thank you thank you that's really important thank because you. i think yeah because it's very important because what patient is going through it has to be we have to address them from the very start telling them about the procedure telling them what they will go through and if they have the right knowledge they feel empowered also because sometimes that is a lack where they feel like they are they have not been given proper information and they they are nowhere they they cannot be they are not guided properly so i think that's very important that it uh, we should have that uh, always we should advocate that having a multidisciplinary approach should be there for the patients i also have some questions regarding the dual simulation that you had mentioned i mean that's a fantastic idea especially in patients that are facing breast cancer and this is their only option before starting chemotherapy um what are the you know guidelines that you would recommend for for the patients that are best candidate for that versus the ones that probably should not consider a dual stimulation? Patients who have a low AMH, they are the ones where you would consider dual stim because you want to at least have 12 to 15 oocytes or at least 10 oocytes. People who have a good ovarian reserve, you don't need it because you'll get sufficient in one uh, stimulation itself. But where you need to maximize that number, those are the ones where wherein you'd go so how about those it's clinics that are really challenging let me tell you yeah oh i can only <laughs> very imagine. nice on paper but when the patient has to go through injections for almost four weeks at a stretch it is physically challenging and and patients may yeah. not have that time right that's the other thing yeah. depending on the stage of their cancer the other um concern here the is that you cancer, mentioned the advantage is that between the time they have the surgery and they start chemotherapy, they have a good four to six weeks. So they can have even two stimulations. So from that standpoint, breast cancer patients have an advantage, which other cancer patients may not. Yes, you're right about yeah. that. And then you mentioned um, the skill level and the success rates of the IVF centers themselves. So do you believe that the, this could be considered by the clinicians knowing full well what their oocyte warming rates are or their oocyte frozen oocyte recovery rates are? Yes, it's, it's very, very important because, uh, you know, uh, you are doing a disservice to the patient if you're going to take them up without knowing is your embryology lab uh, up to it. If on thawing, what is the survival rate? What is the fertilization rate? If that has not been standardized in your lab, I personally, I think it is just very unfair, uh, almost criminal actually to offer for oocyte freezing in, so just... in that particular setting. Yes, I, I agree. And I think it's very important. Just one last question for me before we go on to the audience questions is that, um, do you, do you, would you say that this is common practice for clinicians during counseling of the patient and de determining what course of treatment to take to provide them the success rates of their clinics? Mm, I really don't know commonly. The patients have started asking now. So, mm -hmm. you know, it is on websites, but how honestly people present it is, uh, you know, entirely one's own, one's conscience. Yeah. People can give it and it may not be, but be the truth. So that is something which is difficult to determine. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Rajni, I think we have a couple more questions from the audience. Okay. Uh, Sheila, I could not see. I could only uh, see. So, yep, it's in the Q and A. One second. Yeah. Yes. So, it's a uh, uh, Dr. Nalini Sayali is here. Dr. Sayali, mm -hmm. and uh, she wanted to convey that it's an honor to listen to you. Mm -hmm. And she has worked in non fertility unit in Luri Center under Dr. Teresa Wood Woodruff. In India, mm -hmm. I have done about four ovarian tissue vitrifications. My question is for PGTM in breast cancer patients, BRCA mutations shared by Indian patients are not similar to their other eth ethnicity peers. How do we go ahead with PGTM? No, that, that is one of the problems in India. Not everybody is doing the BRCA mutations for their patients. In fact, of all the breast cancer patients that I have done, pre, uh, you know, cryopreservation for, 
I think only 10% had a BRCA mutation done. And this, despite my asking them, many patients refuse. They say, we don't want to know. So, uh, you know, we don't, uh, I, my sister doesn't want to. The sisters, if you advise the sister or somebody, they, they don't do it. And as a, you know, rule, many of the oncologists were not doing it as well. Maybe things have changed now. I don't know. So unless you have that history, obviously, how can you do a PGTM? You can't do unless you know what is the mutation and what you have to look for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think, I hope, Sayali, you got your answer. And the next question we have from our team member, uh, Sravnan. Sravnan is our global director. He's asking that, does IVF increase breast cancer, breast cancer occurrence? I mean, the exp excessive expression of gene can cause cancer. Have you noticed this pattern in the patients? Uh, see, at the moment, whatever studies are there do not show that ovarian stimulation of in increases any kind of cancer. And this has been studied a lot because it has been a concern. Your hormone levels go up, estrogens go up, progesterones go up. So, and multiple repeated, uh, you know, stimulations happen. So initially there was a concern about breast cancer with people who have been exposed to a lot of clomiphen citrate, more than 12 cycles of clomiphen clomiphen citrate, also uh, ovarian cancers. There has all, there have always been concerns for these two, but we don't have any conclusive evidence of causality at the moment. There isn't. Of course, caution always remains, but at the moment, we don't have evidence to suggest that it does. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nalini. So we have, uh, yeah, that, that's it. That's I it. think uh, we have uh, covered all the questions. Sheila, can you see anything else? Nope. We, no. We've got them all. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so Thank much. you, Dr. Nalini. Thank you. Thank you for answering all the questions and for great discussion. Thank you Thank for your valuable time and experience. Thank you so much and for the invitation and uh, congratulations. Yeah, you have shared with us. Yeah. It certainly you. was Thank an honor so to much. have you. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Okay. Rajni, would you like to mention... Um, yeah, that's what I'm going to. So as we uh, announced in the beginning of the uh, webinar that we will be randomly selecting two lucky winners from attendee list today. So Sheila, uh, so now it's the time to announce the name. Sheila, can we have the names? Yes, absolutely. So our first winner is Yukti Burja. Uh, Yukti Bhardwaj. Perfect. Yeah. And then our second winner is going to be um, Khatija Badri. So congratulations Khadija to our Bhatt winners. Yeah. So congratulations, Yukti and uh, Khadija. So uh, we will, our team will contact you soon to just have further detail and share how you can claim the prize. And congratulations once again to both of you. So before we wrap up, we have an, one more announcement to make. We will be having another uh, webinar hosted by Progenesis USA on Wednesday, May 10 at 3 p.m. PST time on a very relevant topic, which will be moderated by Dr. Sheila on role of medical director in lab operations. So we invite all of you to join us on May 10th for this webinar. And with this, we are coming to the end of our webinar. I would like to extend my gratitude and appreciation to everyone for being with us today. We hope you have learned and enjoyed the session thoroughly. Thank you and wishing you all a, a very wonderful day ahead. Have a Thank good day. you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Good evening, Bye. everyone. Bye.